Welcome everyone to South Park Seventh-day Adventist Church. We are so glad you have chosen to join us today as we worship the Lord together and have fellowship. The house of God is such a special place to be. You may have heard people refer to a church congregation as the body of Christ. This is because the Bible explains each of us in, as individual members of one whole body. We hope that you will receive a rich blessing from your worship experience today. Youth Day, May 20th. You don't want to miss it. See you there.
jump right into this sermon before we get there we want to have a word of prayer uh dear heavenly father lord we just thank you for your love we thank you for your mercy we thank you for your grace lord we thank you for the sabbath school lord we learned some lessons about prayer god lord we can take everything to you in prayer continue to just bless us and keep us during this sermon open up our hearts we pray all this in jesus holy name amen and amen the title of our sermon this sabbath is i can't wait I can't wait. I don't know about you, but I hate waiting. And I know I'm not the only one. I hate waiting so much that when I was in college, one of the first times I, I tried to, to get in college, uh, Domino's had just opened up this online ordering service. And when you ordered your pizza, they had this completion bar that would tell you when they were making it, when they would put it in the oven, and when it was ready for you to come get it. And so their guarantee was that when it, they said it would be ready, it would be ready. But on this one day, I remember driving up to Domino's in Huntsville. And I was ready as I was coming down university and I was pulling into the parking lot. I just knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that my pizza was ready for me. But as I came to, to get into the building, I met a young lady named Sarah, and Sarah told me that my pizza was not ready. Now you can imagine how upset I was. How can you tell me online that something's going to be ready, and then when I get there, everything is not prepared the way I thought it would be? I, listen to me, I hate waiting. I hate waiting specifically when somebody tells me something is going to be done and it's not done in the time frame. And the worst part about it is she says, just give me 15 minutes and we'll make sure we have your order. Hold on. You want 15 minutes on top of the 30 minutes I've already given you. I hate arriving for a doctor's appointment. You told me to get there at eight. And when I arrive there, you make me wait another hour. You tell me I hate having reservations for a place to eat. And when I show up on time, I've got to wait 20 more minutes on top of the wait I've already had. Don't tell me something's going to be ready. And when I get there, it's not ready. I don't know about you, but I can't wait. <laughs> I'm telling y'all, I have an issue with patience. I've struggled with it my whole life. And then when, right before I got married, I thought, you know what, I had conquered patience forever. Only to understand that I don't have as much patience as I thought I did. I didn't have, a, I don't have as much of a cool head as I thought I had. Listen to me in this place today. As I'm waiting for my pizza, worse than me waiting 15 more minutes is, as I'm waiting, I'm watching other people come in and get their pizza on time. See, it's one thing for me to have to wait for my own food. It's another thing when I see people who ordered after me getting their food before me. Those are fighting words for me. Have you ever been in a place where you've placed your order with God and God makes you wait? I'm not asking you to walk on water, God. I'm not asking for a million dollars. I'm not asking you to do some incredible miracle. I just need you to do a little something. And all you hear God saying is just wait a little while longer. Have you ever been in a place where you order something with God and you've seen everyone else get their blessing? 
<laughs> when you see everyone else get their miracle, when you've seen everyone else get their breakthrough, when you're seeing everybody else's marriage all right, and you're asking God, when will it be my turn? When will the pizza be ready for me? What's frustrating is when you expect God to do something and you've done everything right on your end. Somebody out there knows what I'm talking about. Uh, come on, God. I've given up. I, I, I gave up cussing. I don't go to the club anymore. It wasn't my choice. The clubs are closed. God, I've given up all the things that I know you didn't like. And I'm trying to figure out why aren't you moving right now? I don't cuss people out like I used to. I don't slap folks like I want to. I've done everything I know, and I don't know why God is still telling me just wait. Waiting on God to open up a door. Waiting on God to answer a prayer. Waiting on God, some of us, to bring our prodigal son back home. Waiting on God to work a miracle. Waiting on God to heal us of a disease that we never thought we'd have. Just waiting on God. Somebody's testimony in 2020 is that this has been a year of waiting. If there was a year that we've ever did some waiting, 2020 is the year of waiting. We're waiting for things to get back to normal. We're waiting for the world to come back to a, a, a place of normality. We're waiting for things to really get back to the way we used to live and everything like that. 2020 has been a year of waiting. Some of us are still waiting on that first stimulus check as they're getting ready for round two. And we have been waiting, waiting, and waiting. And we're like, God, when is something going to happen? Weeks of waiting. Hours of waiting, months of waiting. We have been in waiting for a while now. And God is doing something in our lives. And we're wondering, God, when will the waiting be over? When will it be my turn? When will what I've ordered with you be ready? When will things happen like you made it happen for other people? Come with me to Joshua chapter 1 and verse 6. Joshua chapter 1, and we're going to start with actually verse 1. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 1, and we're going to read 1 through 6. Uh, I would say if you have it, say amen, but I know nobody's really in here. Uh, Joshua chapter 1 and verse 1, I'm going to read it in your hearing. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over to the Jordan, you and all your people in the land that I am giving them to the people of Israel. Every place that thy sole of thy foot will tread upon, I have given it to you just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness of Lebanon, as far as the great river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea towards the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Somebody say amen out there. Be strong and courageous for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. What an important passage of scripture in which God is telling uh, Joshua, just like I was with that boy Moses, I'm going to be with you. As I was moving in his life, I'm going to move in your life. I just need you to be strong and courageous. You're going to lead the people into something fantastic. You're going to lead the people into something they've never been in before. But I need you to be strong and courageous. I need you to understand that the children of Israel, they understood what waiting was all about. They were, I'm trying to discreetly open up this bottle, but it's not working. But the children of Israel, they understood what waiting was all about. They, under, they had been waiting for 40 years for, for a promise that God had promised to Abraham a, a way long time ago. 
And as they had begun to wait, we can read in the Bible where seven times God promises a land to them that would belong to the children of Israel. He's been telling them, I have a land that's filled with milk and honey. I have this fantastic place for you. Will you be able to rest and you can call your own? You won't have to worry about just being a, a, a nomad or being homeless. You're going to have a home where you and your children will be able to raise and live. But the problem was, although God had promised the children of Israel something, we see specifically that the problem wasn't in the promise. The problem was with the people. Numbers chapter 14 gives us some more information as we're talking about this subject of the people and the children of Israel and how they just struggled in and out of following God and how they were told to go into the uh, to go into the Canaan land. And as they were supposed to go and possess the land, they sent 12 spies. And these 12 spies were supposed to survey the area and really get an understanding of what their enemies were doing. But as they were looking at their enemy, some of these brothers began to be afraid. And they were so afraid that they looked at their enemies as giants as them, and as themselves as insects. It was scary. And when they came back, they gave the Israelites a false report while Caleb and Joshua were telling them, hey, we need to seize the land. I know it won't be easy, but we can take these guys. And because they were so afraid, they decided not to follow God. And this really brought, draws us to something really important. As they were disobedient, God had to put them in time out for 40 years. But when God shows up in Joshua chapter one, he lets them know, hey, the wait is over. I know you can't wait any longer. It's time to go and possess the land. So it's time for them to cross over the Jordan and move into a new thing. I, this is the thing that he had promised Abraham, that he had talked to Moses about. And now Caleb and Joshua are the only two Israelites who are still alive after that 40, that generational period. And now they're getting ready to march into this new place. And it's time for them to really do this thing. And they know that the children of Israel, they know and they understand that their delay was based on their disobedience. Somebody out there can say amen in the comments. Their delay was based on their de de disobedience. Because whenever we disobey God, there is always a cost and a consequence. Somebody out there know what I'm talking about. When God says no, but we force a yes, cost and consequences. When God says go this way and we go that way, there will be cost and consequences. When God says not him and you says, oh yes him, cost and consequences. Joshua realized that our disobedience causes our delay. And honestly, if we look back over this year and some of the years of our lives, we can understand that there were a lot of things that God gave us to groom us, a lot of things that the devil sent to us to tempt us, but there's a lot of things that happened in our life that we were the perpetrators of our own misfortune. That we're actually dealing with the costs and consequences of our own actions. I knew it would get even quieter in here than it already is. Is there anybody in church who can be honest? And I know it's hard because we struggle with this because really I, I, I was preaching this sermon in my own church. I was doing this series on hypocrisy and I was teaching this idea that when we are taught how to basically function in the church, we are immediately taught side by side how to be hypocrites. We are taught not to be honest about things. We are taught to hide certain aspects of ourselves. We are taught that we should not confess certain things to one another. We are taught how to be hypocrites as we move in. And it's hard for us. Listen to me. I know some of you want to shut me off right now. But it's hard for some of us to admit as we are. Some of us are sanctified hypocrites. And we don't want to admit that we've ever messed up. Listen to me. We all stand before God guilty. I don't care how holy you look, how big your Bible is, how often you tune into church. All of us have sinned and had to deal with the cost and consequences. 
disobedience, listen to me, caused their delay, but God in his mercy did not destroy them. I don't want you to miss this. Disobedience causes delay, but God in his mercy did not destroy them. Listen to me. Some of us, we want a partner. We want a house. We want to have a deeper relationship with God, but our disobedience causes the delay, but God in his mercy, he doesn't destroy us. So look at this. Look at this. I'm looking for somebody out there, somebody out on, on, on Zoom or who's watching on YouTube who know they made mistakes, that I've done things that I wasn't supposed to. And if it had not been for the mercy of God, is there anybody out there who can understand that if it wasn't for God's mercy being new every morning, where in the world would I be? I don't want everybody, anybody to miss this. I want to make this clear as day. My disobedience causes my delay. But his mercy, it didn't allow me to be destroyed. And this is the best part. Because of his grace means that I cannot be denied. I'm going to say that one more time. My disobedience caused my delay. And, my, and because of his mercy, I was not destroyed. But because of his grace, I cannot be denied. That means that although I don't deserve it, he can still do things for me. Somebody ought to say amen out there. God comes to Joshua like this. I know that the children of Israel are terrible. <laughs> I know they have a proclivity to complain. I know that they are prone to disobey. I know that they are stiff necked, but I'm still going to give them the land because I promised it to them. Even though you don't deserve it, even though you didn't earn it, even though you shouldn't have it. God is so faithful to his promises that he makes that even when you aren't faithful, he can still be faithful. Somebody know we serve a good God out there, even though you don't deserve it, even though you didn't earn it, even though you shouldn't have it. And what the devil loves to do is that in moments like these, he loves to remind us of all the ways that we have discounted ourselves from the blessings of God. And he loves to call to our mind all the things that we've done wrong. But I've come to tell you that in this time frame that we're in right now, every promise that God has made, he will keep. Is there anybody out there online who knows that any promise God will make, he will keep? God already knows how raggedy we are. God already knows we don't deserve it. God already knows we're sinners. He's not surprised. He already read the book. He knows how this whole thing's in. But God can give it to us anyways. As we're looking at this, God tells Joshua this. I'm going to give you the land because I swore it to your ancestors. And I'll put your name on the land. God says, I'm going to put your name on the land. There are things that God will do for us because he puts our name on them. I, I remember there was a story of a father who had bought his son an Apple pencil and his son had been begging for it for weeks and weeks and his birthday was coming around and he said, you know what, I'm going to get you this Apple pencil because you've been doing well in school. You've been a great child. I just want to reward you for your just great behavior and the way and the person that you've becoming. And so he went and bought that Apple pencil. And as he was there, he decided to get his son's name engraved into the pencil. As he was coming home and he was getting ready to put the gift, uh, give the, the gift to his son, he heard his son cussing out his younger brother. And so as he was just in shock of his son doing such a thing, the son also noticed that he had an apple pencil in his hand. He said, Dad, is that for me? And he said, well, it was for you until I heard all the things that you were saying and doing. He was so upset that he decided he wasn't going to give his son the apple pencil. So the next day he takes the pencil back to the Apple store and as he was giving it to the, the, the customer service representative, as he was giving it to the person, they said, you know what, we can return this until they looked at this child's name engraved in it. The problem was the man said, well, if you would not have engraved your son's name on it, we could have returned it. But the fact that his name is on it, it means it belongs to him and we can't do anything about it. There are things that God, listen to me out there, has put our name on in 2020. 
All things will work together for our good. Got your name on it. No weapon formed against me. Got your name on it. Weeping shall endure for a night. Has your name on it. No plague will come now. Our dwelling has your name on it. I don't know about you, but if there's a promise in the word of God and God has my name on it, I'm going to claim it every day I can. God shows up and says, the wait is over. Come on, somebody out there is happy because you like me and you don't like waiting. Come on, the wait is over. He said, you don't got to wait for this thing. And then after he says the wait is over, he moves into this really insensitive statement. I'm going to read it for you because it's so harsh. I had to read it more than one time. And this is Joshua chapter one, verse one. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant is dead. Now, therefore, go, go arise and go over to Jordan, you and your people. <laughs> Did you hear that? He says, Moses, thy servant is dead. No qualms about it. No sensitivity. He's gone and it's time to move on. I mean, that thing is so rough because if you read your Bible, you'll understand that Joshua looked up to Moses. That was not even Moses wasn't Joshua's boy. That was his mentor. That was like a surrogate father. That was that was the guy who every guy probably looked up to at that time. So as you can imagine, this person who he depended on, this person who, if you read your Bible, you'll understand that in Deuteronomy chapter 34, that Moses had actually went missing. And he went up to Mount Nebo. And that's a weird name for a mountain, but he went up to Mount Nebo, I mean Mount Nebo, and he sees all the land, he sees the promised land. And he see, and as he's up there watching and looking at all of the promised land, God blesses him with that. He dies alone with God. And then the Bible tells us something really beautiful. The Bible tells us that God buries Moses. <laughs> That's so crazy to me. God buries Moses. But the thing of the matter is, the children of Israel didn't get that memo. They did not know yet whether or not Moses was alive or dead. All they knew that he was in my age. And God shows up now and says, guess what? Your boy is dead. Now let's go. Can you imagine how tough that would be? Imagine somebody comes to you and says, yeah, your mom's gone. Now let's go ahead and move on. Let's go to our job. Let's do something. Let's move. It would be difficult to move on when your rock has been removed. It's difficult to move on when what you depend on is no longer there. I hope somebody's getting this. It's difficult to move on when the thing that you drew your strength from is no longer there anymore. I'm preaching in here. You just don't know it yet. It's difficult to move on when the things that you put your hope in, the things that you believed in are snatched away from you. And this is the thing that really got to me. They didn't know Moses was dead and God shows up and tells them this thing. And then guess what? There's no funeral. We don't get to see Moses' funeral procession. They're like, it's time to move. It's time to go. And before you get over, you have to accept that some things are dead. You got to accept before you get to the promised land, before you cross over the Jordan, that something that you believed in is no longer here anymore. That thing that you believed in, that thing that you cared about. Some of us, we understand that in this year, we have this has been a year of waiting, but it also has been a year of loss. It has been a year of loss where we've lost loved ones. We've lost jobs. Some of us have lost money and we've lost some things that were important to us. A lot of the things that we put our trust in has been removed from us. And God is saying, guess what? You got to keep keeping on, even though that thing isn't there anymore. Guess what? Stay right here. Stay right here. It gets worse. Nobody sees the body. Nobody confirms that he's dead. God wants them to move on. He just wants them to go, even though there's no evidence of this thing. I need you to know this thing. It's done even though there's no evidence that it's done. It's over even though there's no evidence that it's over. They didn't get a chance to confirm his death. They just had to go off of what it says in Joshua chapter 2. Moses, my servant, is dead. No evidence. 
It's over, listen to me, even though they still text you every morning. It's over even though you still collect a check from that job. Not only did they not get to go, they didn't even get to go to a funeral. And God says to them, they have to move on and not get closure. I'm preaching in here. This is the move. This is what I'm trying to get to. You may not get closure and you may not always get the thing you need to move on. But sometimes God presses you to move on even though there's no resolution. I guess I'm preaching to myself in here. There won't be an apology. There won't be an explanation of why. There was nobody going to tell you I'm sorry for how I treated you. Nobody's going to come and reconcile and make right what they did wrong. Nobody's going to come and create a resolution. There are some things God makes us move on from and we don't get closure on this side of heaven. There are some things you'll never know the reason why. Why somebody would do terrible things to children. Why somebody would lie. Why somebody would cheat. Why somebody would do certain things. You may never get the reason. But there are times when God presses us. And bids us to move on. Even though we don't have closure. Even though we don't have all the resolution. Although we would wish we could have an apology. But these things will not be given to us. It's over with no closure. There are things that you have to move on with. And that will not be explain God says I need you to move forward with no closure because uh, at the base of the mountain not moving because you're wanting Moses to come back you can't wait on Moses you can't wait on Moses no more it's time to move you have to move you have to come expecting that he's not coming back anymore no matter how much you loved it, it's over. No matter how much you wanted it, it's over. No matter how much you needed it, it's over. Listen to me. God had to bury Moses. And this is the good thing because God had to bury Moses because Moses wasn't called to bring them into the promised land. Listen to me. Read your Bible. Moses was called to bring them out, but he was never called to bring them in. And the problem that we get mixed up in we get so attached to people and things that we want things to stay the same forever. When we like something, we want to keep it in that atmosphere forever. Look at Peter. Peter, when he gets around the transfiguration of Christ, he's like, we should build a shrine right here and just stay up in this bad boy. No, it's not going to be like this forever. And we like to stay in the moments where we're happy. We like to stay with leadership that we are comfortable with. But now God is moving with, with Joshua and he's telling Joshua, now it's time for you to lead. It's time for you to move forward. You can't cross over without me burying something. And in the year that we into, we have to understand that there's things that God wants to bury in us. There's some of us, we need to bury anger. There's some unforgiveness that needs to be buried. There's some dreams that needs to be buried. You still trying to be a rapper and you're 30 plus. You still trying to get that YouTube going. It's trash. Somebody needs to tell you that you got dreams that were always unrealistic, but people never let you know. Not all. I'm not the, I'm not going to lie to you. I don't believe in following your dreams because some of our dreams are wicked and utterly wicked. And all they would do is lead us even further from Christ. So yes, there are some dreams that need to die. There is some brokenness that needs to be buried. There are things in our lives that if we, if we really were to be honest, they need to be buried. There's some lying in our lives that need to be buried. They don't need to come uh, follow us to this next stage. Because you can't move forward when there's things that need to be buried. Oh, man, this thing is deep. Can I give God, can I give you the good news? This is some good news. When we're looking at this story, God tells them, I want you, I'm going to actually go to the scripture. God tells him, all right, I want you to number, I want you to measure the place I'm going to give you. He says this, from the wilderness of Lebanon, as far as the great rivers Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea towards the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life, just as I was with Moses, I will be with 
you. Very clear. He says, all right, from the Lebanon over to the great rivers, Euphrates, all this area that you can step foot on to the going down of the sun will actually be your territory. What I've come to discover is that this area that they're getting now is significantly different from what the spies were looking at when they went in in Numbers chapter 14. If you read in Numbers chapter 14, you'll understand the picture that they were actually spying out a lesser portion of the land. And now God tells them, all right, I'm giving you that portion that you spied out plus more. I, I don't want you to miss this. I'm giving you the portion that was already seen and they had looked over and surveyed. But I'm also giving you a significantly larger amount than what was given. God actually promised them more than what they were expecting. <laughs> I'm sitting in dominoes. I'm waiting. It's been 15 minutes. She comes out and says, just give me 10 more. <laughs> she says, give me 10 more. I don't even want the piece at this point. But as I'm waiting, I see Sarah come out again. And in her hand is five boxes of pizza. And I'm scared because I'm like, Lord, she going to give me five boxes of pepperoni thinking she hooking me up. <laughs> and as she brings the pizza to me, they're all cheese pizzas. On, and I say, I only ordered one. She says, because you waited, yes, we're going to give you more than what you asked for. Is there anybody in here who can believe that God will do more than what we can even ask or think eyes have not seen? Somebody listen to me. Ears have not heard nor have entered into the hearts of men what God has prepared for his people. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all we can ask or think. God can do more than what we promised. Yeah, we're tired of waiting. Yes, we been in this pandemic for a while but I know that if we wait we have something waiting on us that was a word I that wasn't even in my sermon I would say that again because I like that for myself if we wait we have something waiting on us and it's greater than what we have I want us to take this thing to the next level I'm serious in this place today we talked about prayer this morning in Sabbath school and the reality is I've noticed in church, listen to me in this place, my sermon's pretty much over, I'm just a filibuster. But uh, at, at what I've noticed that in church is that the reality is either we pray or we don't pray. There is no middle ground with prayer. I really seen that. Either you're praying continually or you're probably praying uh, every time something bad happens. All right, so listen to this. We expect these things from God. We are waiting on things from God. Some of us are waiting on things from God we don't even talk to him about. We're waiting for things from God we don't even pray to him about. And as we're talking about this thing, as we're getting deeper into this understanding of this, the thing I want to challenge us this day is, I want us to challenge ourselves with our prayer life. Challenge, challenge us to ask more of God. And, and, and not just that, ask God to ask more of us. God, I want you to use me more. I want you to do a new thing. I know that this pandemic was not an accident, but you saw it coming. And you allowed me to be alive to live through such a thing as this. I keep telling all my pastor friends that as great as E. Cleveland was and Walter Pearson and all these other great preachers, God did not assign them to this day and age. I'm preaching in here. <laughs> he didn't allow them to live through this part. But he's allowed each and every one of us to be ministers during one of the most difficult times in human history. While a national, where a worldwide disease is ravaging. And then with a, even in the midst of this, he's saying, keep going, keep preaching, keep giving Bible studies, keep praying. My thing is this, not to, for us to slink back, but for us to lean forward. For us to challenge ourselves, yeah, maybe I haven't been praying at all. Let's turn up that prayer line. Let's move forward. Let's let this waiting be for something. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to give you all the glory and the honor. Lord, we know that when we wait, there's a purpose. 
when you call us to wait, you have greater things ready for us. Lord, and you've called us during this season to wait. Help us not get weary in well-doing. Give us patience. Give us understanding. Help us understand that, Lord, beyond what we can ask, you can do more than that. Beyond what we can think, you can do more than that. Lord, we give you all the glory and honor forever. Amen.